David's son Absalom is back in Jerusalem. He had been exiled because of the murder of his brother Amnon, but David longed for his son. With some intervention by Joab, David agreed to bring Absalom back. But David did not let his son see his face for two years. But as chapter 14 ended, David called for his son and Absalom came and prostrated himself before him and his father the king kissed him. But though things appear to be well, Absalom is plotting once again. Let's see what he's up to. I'm in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1, reading from the New American Standard Version. Now it came about after this that Absalom provided for himself a chariot and horses and 50 men as runners before him. Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. And when any man had a suit to come to the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? And he would say, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but no man listens to you on the part of the king. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. Then every man who has any suit or cause could come to me, and I would give him justice. And when a man came near to prostrate himself before him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom dealt with all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. So Absalom is positioning himself. He's got his chariot, horses, runners, the trappings of royalty. And he says, I know how I will win the hearts of the people through the court system. Hearings were held in the morning outside by the city gate. So Absalom would get there early, position himself, and get people's attention as they were on their way to the gate. They know who Absalom is. He's the king's son and he's striking the most handsome man in Israel. So he approaches and he's charming, I'm sure. What city are you from? And he begins to speak ill of the king and the government. You've got a good case. Too bad no one will listen to it. Now, if I were judge, Every man would be heard and I would give him justice. People are prostrating themselves before him. He's being gracious. Absalom is quietly stealing people's hearts. Continuing verse 7. Now it came about at the end of 40 years, and it's generally noted that this should be four years, that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go and pay my vow which I have vowed to the Lord in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow while I was living at Gesher in Aram, saying, If the Lord shall indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. The king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. So Absalom, whom we know is good at patiently scheming, went about his tactics at the gate for about four years. Now it's time to act. He tells his father he's going to Hebron to pay a vow. Hebron is where David was first anointed king. It's also where Absalom was born. It's also the place where sacrifices are often made. So of course, David would have no problem. He'd even encourage his son to go fulfill his vow to the Lord. Continuing verse 10, but Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom is king in Hebron. Then 200 men went with Absalom from Jerusalem who were invited and went innocently and they did not know anything. 
And Absalom sent for Ahithophel the Gilonite, David's counselor from his city, Gilo, while he was offering the sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. So Absalom had been saying, Oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. What he really wanted was to be king. And he's not patient enough to wait for a proper succession to the throne. He wants to subvert and overthrow his father David. And he has planned this thing. He's got spies throughout the land. He's got 200 men with him to give the impression that this is official. And he's got Ahithophel. David's counselor. Important to note, Ahithophel is Bathsheba's grandfather. It goes to Absalom's cunning nature to be told that the conspiracy is strong. The people are increasing continually with him. Continuing verse 13, then a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for otherwise none of us will escape from Absalom. Go in haste, or he will overtake us quickly and bring down calamity on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Then the king's servants said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king chooses. We might read this and think, David appears to be giving up easily. Why is he so quick to flee? Isn't he a warrior? David is older now, and he knows that if Absalom has stolen the hearts of the men of Israel, Absalom has the position of strength. David is thinking the best strategy is to leave Jerusalem and move into the country. And could he ever forget that God said the sword will never depart from his house? He may be thinking this is from God, and if so, who can stop it? But it doesn't mean he's not looking to God still. Psalm 3 is a psalm written by David that reflects this time when he fled from Absalom, his son. O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon your people. So in the face of treachery by his son, David is clinging to God, looking to him as his shield, his glory, the one who lifts his head, his salvation. Continuing verse 16. So the king went out and all his household with him. But the king left 10 concubines to keep the house. The king went out and all the people with him and they stopped at the last house. Now all his servants passed on beside him, all the Cherethites, all the Pelethites, and all the Gittites, 600 men who had come with him from Gath passed on before the king. Huge delegation that includes even foreigners who have sworn service to the king. Remember Gath is in Philistine territory. Continuing verse 19, then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, Why will you also go with us? Return and remain with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile. Return to your own place. You came only yesterday, and shall I today make you wander with us while I go where I will? Return and take back your brothers, 
mercy and truth be with you. But Ittai answered the king and said, As the Lord lives, and as my lord the king lives, surely wherever my lord the king may be, whether for death or for life, there also your servant will be. Therefore David said to Ittai, Go and pass over. So Ittai the Gittite passed over with all his men and all the little ones who were with him. While all the country was weeping with a loud voice, all the people passed over. The king also passed over the brook Kidron, and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. It almost sounds like Ruth's pledge to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Ittai the Gittite seems to be following not only David, but David's God. And God in his grace has given David these soldiers for protection. They are now leaving the city and moving toward the wilderness. Continuing verse 24, Now behold, Zadok also came, and all the Levites with him, carrying the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God. And Abiathar came up until all the people had finished passing from the city. The king said to Zadok, Return the ark of God to the city. If I find favor in the sight of the Lord, then he will bring me back again and show me both it and his habitation. But if he should say thus, I have no delight in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. The king said also to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace and your two sons with you, your son Ahimaaz and Jonathan the son of Abiathar. See, I am going to wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. Therefore Zadok and Abiathar returned the ark of God to Jerusalem and remained there. Some of you may remember from 1 Samuel chapter 4 when Israel lost a battle to the Philistines and they said, let's go get the ark of God so that it can deliver us from the power of our enemies. They saw it as a good luck charm and they still lost the battle and the ark was taken. David understands that the ark is not a good luck charm. Either God is with him or he isn't. And David has faith that if he finds favor with God, God will bring him back. He says essentially, his will be done. David's also using wisdom if he sends them back, they can find out what's happening and send him word. Continuing verse 30, And David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went and his head was covered and he walked barefoot. Then all the people who were with him each covered his head and went up weeping as they went. Now someone told David saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray, make the counsel of Ahithophel foolishness. Don't you love that? It happened as David was coming to the summit where God was worshipped that, behold, Hushai the archite met him with his coat torn and dust on his head. David said to him, If you pass over with me, then you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in time past, so I will now be your servant. Then you can thwart the counsel of Ahithophel for me. Are not Zadok and Abiathar the priests with you there? So it shall be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall report to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. Behold, their two sons are with them there, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send me everything that you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city and Absalom came into Jerusalem. So Absalom's got his spies and now David has his. 
this one Hushai will be perfectly placed within Absalom's inner circle. I have to go back to David's prayer in verse 31. David's most trusted advisor has taken up with the enemy. David doesn't explode. He doesn't despair. He doesn't even vent a little. His reaction is to pray. Do you cling like that? When something happens or you get news that something has happened, is that your response? David went from a one-on-one -on -one conversation here to a one-on-one -on -one conversation here. He knew where his help came from. And then the prayer itself, make the counsel of Ahithophel foolishness. You have to know God to pray that prayer. You have to know that he is so sovereign that he can direct the thoughts of man. He can cause people to judge thoughts in a particular way, to regard one person's counsel as valuable and another's as foolish. David knew God was able to do that and he boldly prayed that prayer. Clinging to God is knowing God and trusting God. May we be quick to pray. May it become our reaction to pray. And may we trust that our God is a sovereign God.